Romans chapter 12, we are returning there once again on this communion Sunday morning because the doctrine in which we are being engaged to think about and to put into practice in our lives is such a blessing for us. We are studying the oft-neglected doctrine of Christian conduct. I say oft-neglected doctrine because not because it isn't spoken about in evangelical circles, in Christian circles today, the idea of obedience, the idea of how we live, that is spoken about, but rather I speak about it this morning because far too often as Christians, the very truths that we love, the very truths that we hear about, sadly don't get translated into our lives in daily practice. If we're honest, if we think about our own Christian lives, we have heard, if we've been in the church for any number of years, we have heard thousands of teaching, thousands of hours of teaching through radio, reading, through messages taught, Sunday schools and otherwise, by which we have heard truths that we love, truths that we resonate with, truths that we embrace, and yet truths that very often don't get put into practice. Sometimes we unintentionally or even intentionally segment our lives into two different groups. We look at our life and we see our church life as one segment of our life and everything else in our life is secular. And the two rarely intersect. And yet, the fact of the matter is that as Christians, we do not live our lives in this world. We are not here in this world living our lives, and therefore, because we are called Christians, we do Christian things. That is not the essence of our life. That is not what we are to be. We are not to be Christians who do Christian things and thereby we are identified as Christians. No, we are Christians. That is our new identity. We are in Christ. We are Christians, followers of Christ. And because we are Christians, we live in the world as Christians are to live. And we live that way each and every day in every situation that we encounter, both in the church and in the world. Not so that we can be identified as a Christian, but because we are Christians. In other words, our Christianity is not made up of what we do. Our Christianity is who we are. It is our identity. It is who we are. And therefore we do. Therefore we live as we are commanded to live because of who we are. This is in fact one of the reasons for the ordinance of communion. One of the reasons why we celebrate communion as we do, it is a reminder to us, to the Christian. It's not a reminder to everybody. It is not a reminder to people who just want to have some kind of religious experience. It means nothing. There are hosts of people who celebrate communion on Sundays who have no relationship with God whatsoever, and they assume that through that communion they can identify as a Christian. That is not the case. Communion is a reminder to the Christian of how Christ lived. A reminder to us of how Christ died and rose again. We are in Him. We are nothing without Him. And therefore, we are to live as a reflection of Him as we are here sojourning in this dark, spiritually dead, dark world. We are to live as Christ. So this makes our Christian conduct extremely important, both for the church as the body of Christ, as we sit here in this local manifestation of the universal reality of the body of Christ in all the Christians of the world, makes it extremely important for us as the church and for the world. 
It's important for the world because the world is looking at us. The world is seeing us. The world is watching us. They are watching our individual Christian lives as they are watching us this day as we come each and every week together. And the world is to be seeing in us the reflection of the saving grace of the gospel and the transforming power of that gospel in our lives. And so we focus our attention again on this crucial doctrine that Paul has brought before us beginning in chapter 12. And so as we draw our minds here once again, let's bow for a word of prayer and ask God to attend to our time. Father, once again we bow before You. For we know as Your children called by Your grace because of Your mercy, we need You with us. We need Your Spirit working in us. We need all of your supernatural power to open our hearts and our minds to embrace the very truths that you have for us and empower us by your Spirit to do them. So Lord, attend to this time. May the words spoken this morning be your words. May they be massaged into the heart of each one of us that they might become part of us that we might be like Christ. A reflection of the very glory of You and the Gospel that will save. So Lord, attend to our time by Your grace and mercy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning, we return to chapter 12, and I want to draw our attention just to verse 14. Just to verse 14. By the way, I was reading this week, I know we walk pretty slowly through the Scriptures, and much of us uh, kind of use that as a, as a fun, kidding way for me, because I'm not smart enough to walk any faster, but we walk pretty slowly, and I was reading this week Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preaching through Romans at the very same place we are right here when he preached, just for your help. It was his 324th sermon. We're at 102, if you're counting. So we need to go back to chapter 1 and start over. <laughs> anyway, we're at chapter 12 and verse 14, which says this to us. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now, if you remember from last Lord's Day, I reminded us that there is a transition taking place in the structure of the text. While the Apostle Paul, for us, is still concerned with how each and every one of us as Christians are to be living, our action, our way of life, because the fact of our life is a testimony of the gospel of God upon the world, the world sees the gospel in us, hopefully. Paul is turning the corner, however, within that doctrine of our Christian conduct so that we see it from another angle. And this is one of the beauties of Scripture where we take the principle that we're learning and, and as if it's a diamond with multi-cuts on it, we turn it just one little space so we can look at the principle through another angle. And you remember in verses 9 through 13 that we looked at just how we are to act toward our fellow believing Christian brothers and sisters. And of course, if we are to boil it down to what we have learned into this nice little dense principle that we sometimes like to have, it would be no different than if we quoted Jesus Christ when he was speaking to the Jewish leaders and they asked him concerning the greatest law. This would be the principle that we could boil it all down to in verses 9 through 13. And we're familiar with Jesus' response to the Pharisees as he summed up the great commandment and he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. That is simply to say what Paul has been saying beginning in verse 9. Love without hypocrisy. 
Love without hypocrisy. Don't play a game with loving. Don't play a game when you say you love God and yet you live as if you don't. Don't be a game player when it comes to the relationship that you have with the Godhead through the Son. Don't fake it. Don't act as if you love God when in fact your life doesn't reflect it. Our lives are to be a genuine picture of a genuine love for God. And that shows itself in how we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. First John clearly says it. John says, if you say you love God, but you don't help your brother, how can the love of God be in you? In other words, because God has first loved us, we, are to, we love Him. We have a genuine love that flows for each other that is reflected in a devotion to one another, as Paul said in verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And again, we have a diligence in serving one another. Verse 11 says we're not lazy in, in how we serve. And we have a rejoicing in Christ, no matter the circumstances we find ourselves in. Verse 12, it really doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter if someone's eclipsing me in the ministry. It really doesn't matter any of the situations I have. I just rejoice in hope because I know that I'm in the family of God. And therefore, we have a willingness, a willingness in light of all of that to enter into the needs of other suffering brothers and sisters around the globe, verse 13. We have a willingness to contribute to the needs of the saints. And so we could say obedience, obedience is the blessed life. Obedience is the blessed life. Unfortunately, many Christians seek life's blessings from all kinds of external things rather than simply from obedience. And the reason that we do that sometimes is because we fail to realize the way to blessing here and now in this life, the way to true happiness, real happiness, is through obedient living. How we forget that as Christians is sometimes overwhelming and sometimes stunning, really. But we do because of our own sinfulness. The principle of blessing comes through obedience and cursing through disobedience is all over throughout the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament. With obedience comes blessing. And so if we are concerned at all with being truly happy in this life, then we should walk obediently. Psalm 1 is a clear reminder of that to us, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Nor does he stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. This is the pattern. This is the pattern. A, a distancing from, a, a lack of desire for the worldly things and the worldly philosophies and the worldly ways and a greater and greater increasing capacity and desire for the things of God, for the Word of God, a desire for hearing from God, a renewing of our mind, as Paul says in verse 2. And there is benefit to that. There is blessing in that because Psalm 1 says that the man who does that will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. One that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. The contrast, of course, begins in verse 4 of Psalm 1, but the wicked are not so. The stark contrast between the one who walks obediently with the Father, obeying what God has asked of him, desiring and striving to live out the things of the Scriptures, compared to the one who has no time for that, no desire for that at all, and ostensibly, certainly, because they have no relationship with God at all, the wicked are not so. They're like chaff which the, world, which the wind drives away. 
You turn the page and you go into the New Testament. You come into the Gospels and you hear Jesus speak the same truth in John 13. We know the passage well. Jesus has just been with his disciples. He has shown them the great example of how to serve one another and he takes the towel and wraps it and goes and washes the disciples feet he becomes not simply the one who is to be served but the one who serves the others who don't deserve service at all really and he is caring for them with the love of a brother and he says to them do you know what i've done to you you call me teacher and lord and you are right so I am. If then the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. And then he said this, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. You know what's right. You know what the Scriptures say. You know what the truth is. Blessing comes when you obey. So there is the principle. Happiness for us as Christians comes through obedience. And therefore, our obedience and our obedient lives become one of the clearest testimonies that others see about the transformation of the gospel and its power in a, the life of a sinner. The obedient Christian is one of the best forms of evangelism there is. And so, with that in our minds, let's look at verse 14 a bit more carefully. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. I don't know about you, but one of the things I love about the Bible is that it deals with everything. It deals with everything. In other words, the Bible is absolutely sufficient in addressing all things about life and godliness. It is completely sufficient for everything. It's so practical. It's so real. And what we are learning is that when we come to Christ, when Christ draws us to himself, when we are saved... And when we are Christians, what we are being told here is that we are not going to have a life that is easy. As if becoming a Christian removes from us any further trouble in life. The Bible doesn't declare that anywhere. No, in fact, it's just the opposite. It's so much so just the opposite that the Bible doesn't even try to hide that fact. That's why we read these words from the Apostle Paul here in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. In other words, the Bible describes here for us the very worst thing that can happen to you. The very worst thing that can happen to you. And it says that in Christ... Because of the mercy of God that you now are living in, the realm that you are in, because you are a Christian and because you are in Christ and because of Christ, you can handle it. You can handle it. It's not too much for you to handle. Now, we're not... Uneducated people here, we know exactly that the world tells us the very opposite. The false teachers today, false teachers throughout history, distort the gospel and they tell people that they should come to Jesus. He has a great plan for your life, they say. 
And what they mean by that is he is going to make you healthy, he's going to make you wealthy, and you will be wise. You'll have prosperity. Just come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and all your troubles are going to go away. Come to Jesus and life is going to be just paved with gold. Come to Jesus and everything's going to be great. Listen, that is a damning lie. Jesus said, Jesus said, in John 16, verse 33, in the world you have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. And so here in verse 14, we hear Paul exhorting us, bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. And so right out of the outset, we understand persecution is inevitable. It's inevitable. We're a Christian we're a Christian, 2 Timothy 3.12. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's not saying that there's two options for the Christian. In other words, for those who don't live godly in Christ Jesus, there's no persecution. You know why we could even say, okay, well, let's take that as a tenet. For those who don't live godly in Christ Jesus, there's no persecution. You know why that might be true? Because you're not a Christian. Because Christians live in obedience to God. They're changed. They're new. And so Paul could say to Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Just as Jesus said in John chapter 16. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 verse 25, if they call the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more shall they call those of his household? It was almost the intimation that if Jesus went through what he went through, then you better realize that as a Christian, we're going to go through even much more. How much more will they treat you like they treated the master and worse? To say it simply, if they hated Jesus that way, then we surely can expect the same treatment. Why? Why? Because we're Christians. Because we're truly Christians. And because the world hates our Savior, it will and does hate us also. And so isn't it wonderful to know? Okay, Paul, great. Let's get to the stuff where we put this into practice. I urge you by the mercies of God to offer yourself to God as a, as a living sacrifice. For what? Because you're going to be persecuted. Wait a minute. Let me just check out. Let me just cut the Bible off right there at verse 14 because I don't want to go there. The other stuff sounded great. We need to settle the fact in our hearts what the world hated about Christ, it hates about us. What it saw in Christ, what it rejected about Jesus Christ, it hates in us and rejects. And this is the kind of persecution we face in all kinds of forms. All kinds of forms today. It can be outright physical harm. Physical harm brought about by some individual who just hates the fact that you're a Christian. It doesn't want to see you continue anymore. And for some sense, in some hateful spirit, and some heart of hate towards you, lashes out with you in some physical kind of way. It could be under the government in which we live, and our government seemingly is going more and more in that direction. But persecution, and sometimes the worst kind of persecution, is oftentimes more subtle. More subtle. It comes in the form of the way you as a Christian are viewed by other people in the various realms and circumstances in which you live and operate. Whether it's your workplace, your neighborhood, your kid's school, the places you interact, people begin to work against you. You are discriminated against. You're overlooked. 
Overlooked in the workplace for a right promotion that you should get, but you didn't get promoted because someone knows you're a Christian and subtly they undermine that and undermine the word and, and you are overlooked against somebody else who maybe has qualifications that are less than yours. Why? Simply because you're a Christian. Simply because you stand for God. You're different. You live differently. You don't participate in their kind of living. Your very life is a shining light upon their darkness. And because of that, they persecute you. The evangelical church today is even going through somewhat of a, an upheaval within itself in reference to relationships, ethnic relationships. They call race relationships, which I believe is really the wrong term. It's ethnicity. They're going through this upheaval and some are saying, we, we need to be treated right. Even Christians are saying, we need to be treated right. And maybe you are a Christian under the man-made label in Society as a minority in some kind of way. You sense a kind of personal discrimination against you because of your ethnicity. Persecution because of who you are. You're a Christian. So how do we respond to the various ways persecution comes our way? How do we adorn the gospel? What is to be our reaction to those kinds of things? Well, here's what the sufficient scriptures say. Bless them. Bless them and curse not. Bless is a very interesting word. Because we all know what it means. You may say, well, if you ask me right now to define bless, I, I could probably give you some kind of definition. That's not what I'm talking about. We all know what it means. Because we've heard of it and we've seen it in action every time we've gone to a funeral. The original word is ulageo, which is the word with which is the root of eulogy. Eulogy. A eulogy is when someone gets up to speak about a person and they speak of the good of them. There are very few times, in fact, I think I've only seen it in a documentary where someone got up and spoke of someone at a funeral in a bad way. No matter how bad the person is, no matter what their life was like, no matter what they did in their life, whoever gets up to talk about them speaks about the good things. They speak good of the person. That's eulogizing a person. That's eulogizing them. Literally, that is the literal meaning of bless. To speak good of. To speak good of. In fact, here's how Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and following. You have heard that it was said. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' greatest sermon that we have recorded for us in scripture here it is sermon on the mount jesus is talking to multitudes of people you have heard it said you shall love your neighbor you're right second great commandment love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and your neighbor love your neighbor jesus said you have heard it said love your neighbor and hate your enemy but i say to you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now that, beloved, is a very penetrating passage because it also shows that this kind of living reflects the trueness of our faith. In other words, it's an example of the transformation that God has done within us through Christ to live this way, to do this very thing. Notice what Jesus says in that same passage, verse 45. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. He's not saying earning salvation. That's not Jesus saying if you do this, you earn a place in the kingdom as if you can work your way into glory. No, he's saying this is a reflection of those who actually know me. Because he, that is God, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, 
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? It says, don't even the tax gatherers do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are, are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you're to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Complete. Fully matured. So what's Paul saying? What's Paul saying here in verse 14 when he says, bless those who persecute you? He's saying, pray for those who persecute you. Pray for them. In other words, speak good of them to God. Speak good of them to God. In other words, do them good in the highest way. Do them good in the highest way. What's the highest way? Pray to God for them. Notice how Paul balances this out so that we fully understand it. He says, bless and curse not. Okay, so we know, we know what blessing is. We know who it is we're to bless. And now the balance is we know what we're not to do. Bless and curse not. Why does he say that? Why does he seem to believe it's necessary? Why has the Spirit led him here to say curse not? Well, I'll postulate one thing for us. Because our fallen tendency is to curse those who persecute us. That's our tendency. Paul says, stop doing that. Stop cursing them and bless them instead. Now, right out of the gate, I think I know what's on your mind. Because it was on my mind. All right, pastor. Pastor. I hear what that's saying, but I don't curse. I don't curse. I don't use swear words. I would say that's a good thing. Right. I'm glad you don't use swear words. But even if you do, and you shouldn't as a Christian, for a whole host of other reasons you shouldn't, but even if you do or don't, that's not what Paul's talking about here. That's not what Paul's talking about. That's not what curse means here. He means literally, stop calling down a curse on them. Stop calling down a curse on them. Bless them. Stop calling down curses on them. That's our temptation. That's our temptation. Not cussing at somebody. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about calling down a curse. Rather, ask, oh, you know what we do instead of cuss at them? We ask God to take them out. God, get them out of the way. I noticed this in myself this week as I'm driving here to the church, going through Chester. And somebody behind me is irritated that I'm only going 42 miles an hour. And the more irritated he gets, the closer he gets. And sooner or later, he goes around me. It just takes off. And the first thing that comes into my mind is, man, where are the Chester police? <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Small, but that's what we're talking about. That's our tendency. Hey, mister, it's your world. I'm just living in it. Listen, get out of my way. What are you doing to me? That's what we do. It's, it's the first thing that comes to our mind. That's our sinful tendency. There may be a time when we ought to go to prayer and say, God, they need to be removed. Remove them because your glory is at stake. Because your glory is being defamed. They're blaspheming the name of Christ. Your glory is being maligned. There may be a time for those imprecatory kind of prayers like you read about sometimes in the Psalms. But far too often, 
Far too often, if we're honest, we have to be honest and know that we're just way too emotionally attached to know when that time is. Far too often, my own sin flogs my own clear spiritual vision. So Paul says to us, call down God's blessing upon them instead of calling down God to curse them. I want us to turn back for a moment really quickly to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Because in Luke chapter 9, we can see this action through the words of Jesus as he speaks to his disciples. Beginning in verse 51... Right prior to this, Jesus has talked to them about what the greatness is. And then verse 51 says, It came about when the days were approaching for his ascension. So this is not simply his ascension back to glory. This is his death, burial, resurrection, and sometime later then ascended. So these days are approaching. The end of his ministry is coming. That he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him. And they went and entered a village of the Samaritans. Samaritans were half-breed Jews. These were Jews who intermingled with the nations around them. And the orthodox, non-half-breed Jews hated them. Wanted nothing to do with them. Wouldn't even travel through that country. That's why it was such a shock that Jesus would travel and talk to a, a woman, let alone a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. So this is who we're talking about. They enter a a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him because that's where Jesus is heading. And they didn't receive him because he was sojourning with his face toward Jerusalem. And with the disciples, James and John saw this. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? That's us, man. That's us. We're James and John. The brothers, Boanerges, the, bro- the brothers of thunder. That was their nickname. That's our temptation. That's our temptation. And so we know what's going on in the scene here, right? Jesus is being rejected. Someone is doing things and saying things. And someone's doing stuff, saying that it's Jesus who did it. They don't want to follow Jesus. And James and John are having difficulty with it all. You want us to, to curse them, destroy them? They're hating you, Jesus. They're hating you. How about we just destroy them? Get rid of them. What's Jesus say? Verse 55. He turned... And he rebukes them and said, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of. You guys are speaking out of your mind. You don't know what kind of spirit you're of. For the father of, or for the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Oh, oh, there's a change. See, that's the principle of Romans chapter 12, verse 14. That's the principle that Paul is talking about. Jesus says to James and John, don't curse them. In fact, stop cursing them. Don't do that. You you have no idea what, what spirit that's of. I've come into the world to save people. So stop cursing them and ask God to bless them. Bless them in what way? Plead with God to save them. Plead with God to save them. In other words, it's not enough for us when we are persecuted to not retaliate. That's not enough. We're not to retaliate, but it's not enough for us just to sit back and not retaliate. That's helpful. 
But that's not what God fully desires from us. What He desires and what He commands is that instead of not retaliating, instead of praying against them, we pray for them. We pray that God would bless them with salvation. We pray that God would give them the greatest blessing they could ever receive. That's the essence of this text. Not hard to understand. Not hard for us to get. We're to be praying. We're to be praying for those who treat us in the worst kind of ways. Now take that into your workplace. Take that into your home. Take that into your, your own home where you have kids who don't know Jesus Christ and they don't want to have anything to do with you. Bless them. Bless them by praying for them that God would bless them. Now, before we take communion this morning, let me just give us a few ways that will be able to help us do this. How do we do this? How do I actually get myself to the place where I think like that? Well, the first place to start is this. Remember the grace of God. Remember the grace of God. You say, what do you mean? I mean, when you're being persecuted, in your reaction, in your mind and in your reaction, begin by reminding yourself of God's continual reaction to you. Remember the grace of God. What has God done for me? How has God responded to me? And all of it, and God responded that way, all of it before and while I hated Him. Let me ask a question. Were any of us born Christian? Anybody here born a Christian? If you were, raise your hand. You weren't born a Christian. No, we were all born sinners. We were all born in the camp of enemies of God. Alienated from God. We were hostile toward God in thought, mind, and deed in every way. And there was nothing in us that would invite God to like us. Nothing. And yet, here we are today. Christians, Christians, in the family of God, we are Christians because and only because God did not curse us. He did not curse us. Instead, he loved us. He blessed us. So whenever we find ourselves reacting or tending to react sinfully to any kind of persecution, And we want to curse the person? Just stop yourself. Stop yourself. And ask, what if God dealt with me like that? What if God dealt with me like that? Where would I be right now? We're trophies of grace, like I said. So pray for them. Pray for them. Pray that God would make them a trophy of grace, just like you are. That's the first thing. Secondly, secondly, remind yourself why. Remind yourself why the persecutor, no matter who it is, why they are acting like they are. Remind yourself why. They're doing what they're doing because they live in sin. That's where they live. They can't get away from it. It's who they are. They are separated from God. 
And so in, a, in the grandest sense, it has nothing to do with you. This isn't mind game. This is reality. It has nothing to do with you at all. It has everything to do with their alienation from God. And so while they may be sinning against you, the greater problem is their relationship with God. That's their greater problem. And the only thing that will help them is Christ. It's the only thing that will help them. They're a slave of sin. They're a slave of Satan. They do what they do because they are darkened in their mind and they hate Christ. They hate Christ. So what do you do? Pray for them. Pray for them. You speak well of them to God and plead with Him to save them. In the same way He graciously saved you. That happened to me this week as I was in the house. There was a knock on the door. Didn't know who it was. Not many people come to my house. Go downstairs. A woman is standing on my porch. I go outside. I said, hi. She says, hi, we're in the neighborhood. I said, and who are you in the neighborhood? She said, we're, we're the Jehovah's Witness. I said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, unfortunately, we don't believe the same thing. She said, oh? I said, no, you don't believe Jesus Christ is God. She said, well, we believe he's the son of God. And I said, I know that's the problem. You don't believe he's God, even though he said it. And she kind of was, took herself back, took a breath and said, well, I appreciate talking to you. <laughs> and she walked off. And I thought, man, I need to pray for her. You see, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter the circumstances. It doesn't matter where persecution comes from. It doesn't matter how it gets into our day. Whatever the angle is, it really doesn't matter. It may come from a friend. It may come from somebody who's an enemy. It may come from an unbeliever. It may come from a sinful believer. It really doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that the remedy for your heart is the same, no matter where it comes. The remedy's right here. Bless and curse not. And in doing so, guess what? You'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. And they will see the testimony of Christ in you. And they will see a reflection of the very words Jesus Christ said when he hung on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Bless and curse not. That principle is very helpful for us in many, many ways, but it's going to be extremely helpful as we go forward in this text. Because of what verse 15 and following says, and especially chapter 13. Well, let's prepare our hearts for communion. Father, this is your day. Every day is your day. None are ours. We're just testimonies of what you have accomplished, what you are doing, what you will do in the future. And Lord, we know we didn't arrive here on our own. We didn't come here because we are smart. In fact, we are the epitome of what Paul said to the Corinthians. Not many noble, not many wise. And yet you chose to save. You blessed us instead of cursing us. It's unfathomable, Lord, how... That would happen, and yet far too often we take for granted the very position that we have been given, and we treat others with contempt, 
calling down cursing upon them rather than blessing. Father, thank you for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that we have in him. We are so sorry that we would live in any other way than how you have commanded us. Father, help our lives reflect both that sorrow and joy that we have in Christ as we revel and celebrate the great blessing that you've given us through Christ. May our lives be a clear testimony of the gospel as we think about what we've been given and the grace you've bestowed upon us as we look at others that we interact with. May we bless them and not curse them. All for your glory because of our Savior Christ, whose name we pray. Amen.